color is everywhere and it plays a massive role in how we perceive products, brands, art, and everything in our world. This video is about the fundamentals of color. And by the end of this video, you'll understand the science of color, how it's created, and how it's modeled by professionals. You'll also have a rigorous, deep understanding of how to choose color and build gorgeous color palettes for any project. And I promise not to include any pop psychology like, if you wanna build trust, use blue, because color is so much more intricate and so much more beautiful than that. So what is color? Basically, it's how we perceive certain wavelengths of light. Of all the millions of different colors we can see, they all appear here on the visible light spectrum. Now, when a wavelength hits our eyes, this color information is processed by over 6 million cells in our retinas called cones. These cones are specialized to respond to a specific wavelength of short, medium, or long wave light, which roughly translates to blue, green, and red. If we get a combination of these wavelengths, like red light and green light, we'll see yellow. This process of creating new colors from more basic ones is called color mixing. And it's how we as designers are actually capable of creating all the millions of different colors we can see. Now there are two basic ways to mix color. They're called subtractive and additive color mixing. And it's insanely useful to know the difference because we'll use subtractive color mixing for all printed materials and really everything we design in the real world. And we'll use additive color mixing for digital design. So what's the difference? Well, subtractive color mixing starts with a white canvas and subtracts wavelengths of light to produce a certain color. You see, by default, even light is called white. It's a combination of all wavelengths of light that combine to form what we see as white. If there's no light, then it's pitch black. So let's say we have a white canvas and an even white light like the sun, which emits all visible colors in combination. Then we'll add a red pigment to our canvas. That red pigment absorbs a lot of green and blue light and reflects red, so that's what we end up seeing. When we add a second color, like blue, it absorbs a lot of the reds and yellows, leaving us with a narrow band of color we call purple. If we add in yellow, it wipes out almost all of the visible light spectrum. What's left is a muddy dark color like a really deep gray. That's why traditionally red, yellow, and blue have been called the three primary colors. Because in traditional Western painting, those were the three colors we could use to create most other colors. But as we'll learn in a bit, these are not the only three primary colors to exist, and this model actually comes with a really big problem. But for now, the takeaway is that subtractive color mixing usually starts with an even white light reflecting on a white canvas. And we can add in pigment to take away some of the visible light spectrum to create different colors. The reverse of this is called additive color mixing. That's where you start with a quote unquote black canvas that creates color by emitting light. This is how a computer monitor works, for example. By default, it's turned off, so it's black. Then we get certain pixels to emit lights to produce certain colors. If we turn all the pixels on with an even full intensity, we get white. That's why additive color mixing is the system we'll use for all digital design. So with subtractive color mixing, you start with white and can mix all the colors together to get black. And with additive color mixing, you start with black and can mix all the colors together to get white. Now, I'm sure you already know this, but monitors don't actually use red, yellow, and blue pixels. They actually use red, green, and blue pixels. Why? Why not use the primary colors we were all taught? Well, the difference is in their color model. You see, using certain primary colors and other parameters to create specific colors is called a color model. And it turns out there's a bunch of them. And some of these color models are super important to understand if you want to create physical or digital designs. Let's start with the color model we all know, red, yellow, and blue. In school, you probably learned that these were the three primary colors colors. And a primary color, by the way, is simply a color that cannot be produced by the model itself. So in the red, yellow, and blue color model, there's no way to mix colors together to create red. And you might have learned that you should be able to create every other color from just red, yellow, and blue. But it turns out this just isn't true. For example, you can't create a really pure green using just blue and yellow. You can try this yourself at home. Mix blue paint and yellow paint together, and you'll find you'll always get a sort of dark, muted green. And that's one of the reasons why modern subtractive color mixing doesn't use red, yellow, and blue at all. And if you want to see this for yourself, all you have to do is take a look at the most popular subtractive color mixing tool ever invented, the printer. You can check your printer and see that it doesn't take red, yellow, and blue ink. It actually takes cyan, magenta, and yellow ink. It also uses black ink because it's more economical to have a pre-mixed black than to use all your printer ink to create black. This modern subtractive color model is called the CMY model. If you add in black ink, it's called the CMYK model. They call black key, by the way, because it calibrates or keys the printer to combine cyan, magenta, and yellow to create black. The reason we use cyan, magenta, and yellow is because these colors have a much broader color gamut than red, yellow, and blue. The green created by mixing cyan and yellow together is much more vibrant than the other model. Basically, with CMYK, we get a greater variety of color options, which is why in subtractive color mixing, the primary colors are cyan, magenta, and yellow. But even those aren't 
the only primary colors. Remember, a primary color is just a color that can't be created in the system itself. And for additive color mixing, the primary colors are red, green, and blue. This is more natural for human beings because our cones are sensitive to red, green, and blue lights, and a screen can emit red, green, and blue light at varying levels of intensity to produce different colors. This is called the RGB model, and it represents each of those colors from no intensity, which is black, to a full intensity like pure red. And most people who use RGB will use eight bits per color, meaning two to the eighth power, which gives you 256 choices for red, green, and blue. And since programmers are weird and like to start counting at zero, that's represented by zero through 255. Now, just like CMYK, there's a fourth attribute to RGB, which is sometimes tied onto it, called alpha, which just means opacity. Now, it's not called alpha because the people that made it were really cool. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It has to do with a fairly technical equation where the Greek letter alpha represents how transparent or opaque a color is. If alpha is set to one, it's fully visible, and at zero, it's invisible. But the takeaway is that the two most basic color models are CMYK for subtractive color mixing and RGBA for additive color mixing. Using these two models, you can create millions of unique colors. Now, there are some obvious limitations, like your printer ink might not be a pure cyan, despite it costing more than literal gold, or your monitor might be 20 years old and the pixels aren't the best. Despite these limitations, for 99% of physical and digital products, you'll use CMYK and RGBA. But there is one big problem with these models, and that's the fact that most people find them pretty hard to use. Some developers might be used to coding in RGBA, where a color doesn't look like this, it looks like this. But for the average person who's interested in design, how can we take what we learned about color and map it onto a more intuitive color model? That's where models like HSB come in. Instead of trying to remember that 255 red, 215 green, and zero makes gold, it just gives us the full range of colors from the get-go. These colors are called hues, and it's what the H in HSB stands for. A hue is a pure color, unmodified by things like transparency or intensity. And we map those hues onto a color wheel with 360 degrees. So we start at zero, which is pure red, we move through to yellow, green, cyan, blue, magenta, and then back to red at 360 degrees after making a full rotation around the circle. But now it looks like we only have 360 colors instead of the 16 million plus we had in our RGB model. That's where our other two parameters come in. First, saturation, which is the purity of a hue. We can decrease the saturation to decrease the vibrancy of a certain color. So we start with a pure red at 100% saturation, and then decrease the intensity until we get a dull gray at 0%. Saturation is also usually in 8 bits, meaning there are actually 256 different options for saturation, but digital programs will typically give you an option from 0% to 100%. So now this gives us over 92 different thousand choices for color, which is still a lot less than our RGB model. So that's where the final layer of color is added by changing the brightness of a hue. Brightness controls the amount of light that a hue emits. Just like saturation, our pure hue starts at 100% brightness. So we'll start with a pure red, at 100% brightness and decrease the light emitting from that until we're at 0% brightness or black. Because of the way that the HSB model works, all colors will eventually converge on black by decreasing the brightness. Brightness is also usually calculated in 8 bits, so there's another 256 choices for brightness. And by controlling the hue, saturation, and brightness, we have just over 23 million different options for color. Now, when those colors actually get computed, they'll get squished down into whatever color space they're in. So if we're using the standard 24-bit RGB model, we're still left with the same 16 million colors. But now we have a much more intuitive way of thinking about color. Instead of trying to memorize specific RGB color combos, we can simply select a hue, set the saturation, choose the brightness, and we've got our color. This is why HSB is everywhere. It's a super easy and intuitive way to think about color, and it lays the groundwork for us to think about how to choose color effectively and create beautiful color palettes. So now we're gonna take everything we learned about color and how it works and apply it to choosing colors for any product, website, brand, or project that you wanna create. And instead of showing you tired, outdated, and frankly wrong pop psychology, I wanna build you a framework so you can think about color effectively and make good color choices. That framework isn't a set of rules, but rather five guiding principles. The first of which is that color is personal. Every person responds to color in a different way. We even all have different capacities to see color. Some people, for example, are born with color vision deficiency, which limits their ability to tell certain colors apart. So there can't possibly be one rule for each specific color. You might have heard that red is the color of romance or that green means healthy, but that's just not always true. Color is not only deeply personal, but the way we think about a color is going to depend on a ton of other factors. For example, stop signs are not romantic, and green can be the color of sickness rather than health. So now that we've cleared up the misconception that a certain color always produces a certain emotion, we're free to examine color at a deeper level. And that's 
that starts with the second guideline, which is that color is contextual. A certain color choice is always related in someone's mind to other things. We never think of color in isolation, but rather in a certain context. Let me give you an example. Here we have two identical bottles of shampoo. The only thing that's different is the color. As customers, we pick up on what these colors mean. The green bottle is probably trying to emphasize that the shampoo is natural. Maybe it's made with natural ingredients, or the company is sustainable, or they even just want to emphasize a floral smell. But green in this context does remind us of nature. The blue bottle, on the other hand, is probably trying to emphasize cleanliness, sanitation, and that fresh, you know, shower feeling. The association we probably have is with water, or beaches, or even other brands of soap. And these associations should be real, by the way. They're not marketing gimmicks. If a product looks all natural, but it's really not, what we associate the color with and the actual reality of that product will cause friction in our minds and we won't buy. This context guideline is especially valuable for companies that don't sell physical products. Plenty of back-end tech startups, for example, will use dark mode websites because they mimic the look of workstations, server racks, or a programmer's bedroom. Our next guideline is that color is connotative. We don't just associate colors with things external to the product, but color should actually say something about the product itself. Let me demonstrate with two coffee brands, Blackout Coffee and Top of the Morning. Blackout Coffee is clearly designed for someone who loves dark roasted black coffee. The packaging uses is black as its primary color to tell the consumer that this coffee is strong and bold. You're gonna taste the caffeine. You don't even have to drink this coffee to have a rough idea of what it's gonna taste like. Top of the Morning, on the other hand, uses much brighter colors. We get the feeling that this is gonna be a much smoother, much lighter cup of coffee. So the colors you pick will say something about your product, brand, or business. This is different from contextual colors because the color here represents the product itself. And once you understand this, you'll start to notice it everywhere. In packaging design, yes, but also posters websites, and even album covers. Your choice here literally colors a person's perception about your design. And one color hardly ever works in isolation, which is why our next guideline is that color is relational. When you design anything, chances are you're going to be working with at least a few different colors. And the color combinations you choose affect one another. Let me give you an example. If we have a red and yellow together, what do you think of? Well, you could think of, you know, a million different things, but I would guess at least a few of you are thinking of McDonald's right now. But plenty of other brands use this color combo as well. Red Bull, Lego, DHL, and a ton more. This color combo often has associations with boldness, speed, and hunger, but it largely depends on the context. We would say these colors are weakly related in most people's minds, unless they can't go like a day without a Big Mac. But what if I change just one color? What if I left the red the same and changed the yellow to green? Red and green tends to remind most people, especially in the Western and Christian world, of Christmas. These colors are more strongly related, and given the right context, they create an automatic association with something else. And that's the point. All these color rules are interconnected. That's because these related colors are also affected by context and connotation, just like single colors are. For example, the food chain Chili's also uses a red and green color combo, but not to make you think of Christmas. They want you to think of red and green peppers. So when you add new colors to a palette, you'll have to be aware of their relationship to one another. Something we'll learn more about when we study practical color systems. Now, red and green being associated with Christmas was no accidental example. It actually highlights our final guideline, which is that color is cultural. The meaning behind a single color or color relationship isn't just changed by someone's personal taste, but rather by their entire cultural upbringing. For example, a snow plowing company in northern Michigan and a surf shop in Hawaii might use the exact same blue in their logos, yet the cultural framework and context for what these colors mean is completely different. One signifies hard, cold winters, and the other signifies cool, breezy beaches. And the impact of culture on color extends far beyond this. In China, for example, red is associated with prosperity. For new parents in the United States, blue is often associated with boyhood. But if we go back in time, many Western painters associated blue with the Virgin Mary, and it was actually seen as a more feminine color. The macro and micro cultures we're steeped in affect our response to color. And you have to be aware of this because it can help you connect with your target audience better. For example, an estate planner or financial advisor should probably not use bright, saturated, and heavily contrasted colors on their website. And by the way, if you want to really learn how color, typography, layout, spacing, and much more affects your web design, you should go to designspo.co. We've got web design case studies to learn from the best designs on the internet, expert designer interviews with freelancers and agency owners, and we're even working on a 30-day design challenge so you can launch your own web design portfolio in 30 days even if you have no previous design experience. We've also got a great community where you can ask questions, get feedback, and collaborate with other designers. I'm on there all the time in case you ever want to ask a question or get feedback on a design as well. So if you want to learn and grow as a web designer, 
check out designspo.co, which will be the first link in the description below. Now we're gonna take everything we learned so far and use it to create practical color palettes. To do that, let's start by returning to the color wheel and learn about the relationships between these different colors. Broadly speaking, the color wheel can be divided into two sections, warm colors and cool colors. This divide isn't absolute, but it rather has to do with our evolutionary experience of color. We tend to notice longer wavelengths of light easier because about 60% of the cones in our retina are dedicated to it. As a result, warm colors tend to stand out more, whereas cool colors fade into the background a bit easier. That's why an all red room might feel a lot more enclosed than a coolly colored room, and why a single red object really stands out against a cool background. Designers often use this effect to create focal points. They might want to get your attention to inform you about danger, or to get you to look at their website's checkout button. Now because every color exists in relationship to other colors, designers have created certain frameworks that can combine them in ways to be used for different purposes. The first framework we'll look at is called monochromatic. These are created by choosing a single hue and adjusting its brightness and saturation to create a color palette. These are great because monochromatic color palettes create visual harmony, they're easy on the eyes, and super simple to create. The disadvantage though is that they can lack high contrast, so you won't get highly visible focus points, and you can't really get a dynamic high energy feel if that's something you're going for. The next framework is called analogous. Here you choose colors that are close together on the color wheel, which usually share the same undertones. As a result, you get a harmonious look with a natural amount of variety. And this is a great choice when you want the balanced feel of a monochromatic palette, but you want more contrast. The main disadvantage though is that you don't get the minimalism of monochromatic or the sharp contrast other palettes provide. If you want the most amount of contrast, you'll want to take a look at a complementary color palette. This works by choosing colors on the opposite side of the color wheel. Now, although they're called complementary colors, these colors actually tend to clash. The big advantage of this is you can make certain things like a call to action really stand out. But that also comes with a lot of extra strain on the eye. If you have two bold conflicting colors, it can be really hard to make them both work. That's why most complementary color palettes will use a majority of one color and only a little bit of the other. If you want to resolve some of this conflict, you can use a split complementary palette. This is where you choose a base color and two colors adjacent to its complement. This provides a lot of contrast without being as harsh as true complementary. But just like a complementary color palette, it still is hard to make all three colors work equally. In fact, for basically any color palette besides monochromatic, you'll usually want to work with some ratio of base color and accent colors. And that's where our next framework comes in, which is often called the 60-30-10 rule. This rule isn't for generating colors, but rather for placing colors in their appropriate proportion. It says that 60% of the design should be covered by a dominant color, which is usually easier on the eye and sets the tone of the design. 30% should use a secondary color, which supports the dominant color and provides some contrast. Finally, 10% of the design should use an accent color, which usually has the strongest amount of contrast. You'll use these sparingly throughout the design, like to highlight a certain element or for your main call to action. Now that we've covered the general framework for selecting color palettes, I want to give you a few resources to generate them easily. At the time of this recording, these are the tools I use the most often. But if you're watching this in the future, they might have changed or been depreciated. But as long as there's internet, there's probably going to be a color palette generator, so just searching that is a great place to start. The first tool you can try is called Coolers. It basically lets you see a bunch of color palettes in a really short period of time, and if there's a color you really like, you can lock it into place. Then you'll repeat this process until you have a basic color palette. Now this is great for generating ideas, but it probably won't get you anything robust. But if I've found a few colors that I like, Next, I'll take them over to UI Colors. UI Colors turns a specific color into a monochromatic range of colors. So you can take your initial color palette and turn it into a modular color system that works for pretty much anything you want to design. I personally use this for each new project that I want to create, and learning this tool is part of the 30-day design challenge as well. Finally, I want to mention Adobe Color because they have a great selection of tools for building great color palettes. You can preview different color harmonies, extract colors from photos, and explore great palettes that other designers have created. So now hopefully I've been able to provide a basic understanding of how color works and how to create great color palettes. But understanding color is only one part of the design process. If you want to watch another free guide on design, you can check out this video I made explaining the fundamentals of typography. And if you want to go even more in depth and learn web design by studying great websites, watching expert interviews, and getting feedback from a community, then check out designspo.co and I'll see you on there.